and welcome to the second edition of Cultural Capital. I'm Nancy Durrant, I'm the Evening Standard Arts Editor, and as London opens up, I've already completely overstuffed my diary. I really don't know how I used to do this, guys. I think I might be getting old. On today's show, despite the last miserable few weeks, we're still clinging on to the idea of spring, so we're at the Royal Academy's new David Hockney exhibition of iPad pictures made last year in the idyllic setting of his home in Normandy. We're talking to the trailblazing theatre director, Dawn Walton, about why she's reviving the great Alfred Fagan's 1975 play, The Death of a Black Man, at the Hampstead Theatre. And I'll be reviewing the big film of the week, the flamboyant and somewhat revisionist origin story of everyone's favourite Dalmatian hater, Cruella de Vil, set in 70s London at the birth of punk. Plus, we're putting another intriguing object from one of London's amazing museum collections under the spotlight in Thing of the Week. In 2018, the painter David Hockney and his assistant JP were on a short holiday in Normandy, and on an off chance, he decided to have a peek at a house that was for sale. He took one look at La Grande Cour, saw the higgledy-piggledy building in the treehouse in the grounds and said, OK, let's buy it. That house became his haven, and by the time lockdown came in April 2020, he was already averaging more than one picture a day, recording the constant seasonal changes he saw happening around him. Now the Royal Academy is hosting an exhibition of his iPad pictures, blown up into vibrant prints that show the arrival of spring as the trees and flowers on his property bud and burst into life. We met the curator Edith Devaney for a restorative stroll. The exhibition comprises 116 works and it tells the story of spring from its inception in, in um, February right through to June. And it was all worked on and observed in one space in David's garden in Normandy. So from four acres, this is, this is the, the various views of the, um, of the garden and the landscape where he is. He started using the iPad first in 2011 and in fact he used it to create the arrival of spring in Yorkshire for an exhibition that we held here. And this is him revisiting the iPad in quite a major way but working with a, 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 an app that has been um, specially tailored for his specifications. He works on the screen knowing that he um, is going to print them out this size um, so all of the, the, the composition and the gestures are, are, are kind of, you know, designed for this scale. And he uses a stylus, um, so it's as if he's kind of, you know, using a pencil on paper. But he's, he's picking up colours on his palette, he's picking up brushes that he's designed to, to make these compositions. In, in terms of hours, it takes him about the same amount of time as it would to do an oil painting. If you take out all of those um, elements of oil painting that is to do with the, the paraphernalia of it, you know, the setting up of the canvas, the mixing of the paints, the, the, um, you know, the, the easel and, and, and everything like that. When you think back of how everyone was feeling, you know, in, in, in spring last year, it was pretty desperate because we were facing a very frightening and unknown situation. And as David was creating this body of work, one of the points he made was, well, they can't cancel spring. And it was very reassuring, actually, this idea that, you know, life carries on, in a, maybe in a different way, um, but we shouldn't lose sight of that that yes, shops and museums and, 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 and airports are all closed, but, but spring continues and, and delivered us a glorious spring last year. And I think for us all to come now and celebrate nature here, um, you know, with depictions of, of last spring when we were going through such a scary time, it's, it's kind of an interesting notion. To go to a park, to see the trees, um, to, to, to look at green, it was, it was soothing, it was good for our souls and we needed it. That exhibition is at the Royal Academy until the 26th of September. Now, 46 years after it had its premiere at the Hampstead Theatre, the black British writer Alfred Fagan's play, The Death of a Black Man, is about to be revived there again under the sharp eye of director Dawn Walton. A pioneer herself as the founder of Britain's leading black-led national theatre company and the first recipient of the Mount View Prize for trailblazers who inspire social change, she talks to us about why Fagan's witty, biting satire is just as relevant now as it was in the 70s. Assume your positions, ladies and gentlemen. 
It's a play that's really picking up the stories of first generation uh, Caribbean. So we had our Windrush age and these are the children of the Windrush. And it's really about the choices they make versus the choices their parents might have made. Playwright's a, a writer called Alfred Fagan, and some of you might know him because there's an award uh, that's named in his honour, the Alfred Fagan Award, a playwriting award. Uh, but uh, Alfred was many things. He was um, of that generation that came here. He had been in the army. He was a champion boxer, apparently he's a welder. Um, but he was also an actor and he started writing right at the beginning of what I would call the sort of black theatre revolution himself and uh, inspired by people like Mustafa Matura, uh, suddenly found the confidence to put authentic black British voices on stage and Alfred was one of the first to do that. It's, uh, it's an extraordinarily prescient piece. Um, it's talking about being black in Britain today it takes on um, the history, our relationship with colonialism, empire. It travels the world in its thinking. And it's something that we're very much engaged with. That conversation is flourishing right now um, due to the results of um, the terrible murder of George Floyd. We're all stopping and listening and trying to have that conversation in a, in a new and fresh way. But here was Alfred having that conversation back in the 1970s, which is extraordinary, sad in some ways. And um, there's something really forward thinking um, and almost prophetic in his writing. Um, it's an astonishing piece of work. It's a funny play and it's a challenging play all at once. He has a real wit about him, um, but it's a really challenging piece. The subject is difficult and I think anybody who wants to sort of see the world um, and leave thinking a little bit differently about the world should come and see this play. The Death of a Black Man starts previews at the Hampstead Theatre tonight, booking to the 10th of July. OK, now it's my favourite bit. We spend so much time banging the drum for the big, splashy, temporary exhibitions in London that the amazing things in our museum collections can sometimes get a bit forgotten. We wanted to give the sometimes beautiful, sometimes disturbing, sometimes breathtaking, and sometimes just really weird things you can see for free across the city their moment in the sun. Here's Thing of the Week. Going to talk to you about one of the most famous objects in the entire British Museum and in fact in archaeology in general and that's the helmet from the great Sutton Hoo ship burial. Now this helmet dates to the late 6th to early 7th century and it's incredibly rare. Not very many of these complete helmets survive from this period whatsoever so it's a really really precious survival from that time. So we have all of the elements of a human face but the longer you look at it, the more you start to see that what you're looking at isn't actually a face at all. Look at the eyebrows and you can see actually that they're the wings of a creature flying up the front of the helmet. The nose is the body of the creature, the moustache becomes its tail and then we see that there's a head of the creature poking up between the eyebrows and meeting the head of another creature, a serpent-like creature coming over the top of the helmet, forming a crest to the helmet. So what we actually have here again is a number of these fierce creatures from the early medieval period that are very attractive to the person that was probably wearing this. And this helmet would have set this person apart because of its rarity and is another reason why we think the person buried at Sutton Hoo was very important in society, potentially even a king. Now, if you'd asked me a few weeks ago what was the first thing I'd want to see after a year of being stuck indoors, the origin story of a psychotic dog-wearing fashionista would not have been at the top of my mind. What an idiot. Cruella, starring the Emmas, Stone and Thompson, is out today and it's exactly the kind of riotous nonsense I needed. From the very beginning, I realised I saw the world differently than everyone else. That didn't sit well with some people. But I wasn't for everyone. I guess they were always scared that I'd be a psycho. 
Cruella is a prequel to 101 Dalmatians, telling the story of how sweet but rebellious young Estella morphs through nature and what you might call a lack of nurture into the coat-obsessed monster we know and love. Emma Stone stars as the titular pet wearer, and the sight of her stomping around 1970s London in a series of increasingly deranged punky outfits is honestly an absolute joy. The script is exactly as fun as you'd expect from Tony McNamara, who wrote The Favourite, and once the first really not very good 20 minutes are out of the way, the director, Craig Gillespie, pulls out all the stops. The twists are ingenious, the heists are a hoot. It's a fabulous love letter to punk era London, and the outfits are incredible. Costume designer, Jenny Bevan, deserves all the awards going. And as the plot descends into catwalk warfare, there's a fashion moment involving a bin lorry that makes a Dolce & Gabbana couture show look like a country fate. If I were going to quibble, I'd say that despite it being a whopping 134 minutes, there are some lovely characters who should have been much better drawn. John McRae's adorable Artie, a glam second-hand shop owner, is one of them, and Kirby Howell Baptiste's gossip rag photographer Anita is, I think, shamefully underused. But it's hard to be grumpy about something this silly and this fun. Cruella is completely barking, and if nothing else, it'll make you want to seriously rethink your wardrobe. But there's something about poetic justice that's just so poetic. Thanks for watching Cultural Capital. If you've enjoyed it, please give us a like, tell us in the comments, share on your socials and hit subscribe. We'll be back next Friday reporting from the London Design Biennial at Somerset House and taking a sneak peek at what's coming up at the inaugural London Gallery Weekend. See you next week.